So thanks everybody uh, for coming this afternoon to uh, this afternoon's dialogue on engaging our communities, museums, galleries, and the humanities. It's especially heartwarming to have everybody here at Macintosh, uh, especially in light of the fact that the, the Blue Jays are playing right now. So thank you all for coming uh, to hear about uh, humanities, museums, and galleries. I'd also like to thank our sponsors for this particular event, and truly, truly thank our sponsors for this event, uh, because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to bring in Professor Lubar to, to give us a wonderful talk last night, but also to meet with so many people across campus, uh, and we were very, very generous to meet with so many of our groups uh, at, here at Western, uh, and we're really, really grateful for that. So we're grateful to the Macintosh Gallery for hosting us here today for the wonderful reception uh, last night. It's a wonderful space to do these types of events, and it's really, really great to have everybody here. The History of Medicine at Western provided some wonderful financial support for us. The Public History <coughs> Program, uh, Michelle, who's on our uh, dais today, has been just so tremendous in terms of uh, helping facilitate this event. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you and your students who are dispersed amongst the crowd here with us tonight. American Studies, who uh, were great hosts for uh, Stephen earlier today to, to chat with him. The Visual Arts Department, which gave us uh, wonderful support, and of course we have uh, Patrick Mann here on behalf of the Visual Arts Department, and the Public Humanities Program, which helps support uh, this event and I'm a member of. I'm uh, Josh Longe, I don't have my placard, but I direct the Public Humanities Program here at Western, and I'll be moderating our dialogue for today. I should note too that we will have complimentary pizza to follow, but only after we've done some rigorous cogitation <laughs> over the question of public engagement in the arts, humanities, and the social sciences, both here on campus, but also uh, thinking to our community in London and even beyond. So in recent years, there has emerged a new paradigm of engagement in higher education to rethink the public mission of universities and colleges across North America. Canadian universities have increasingly focused attention on the public good as an integral part of the strategic planning process and integrated robust community engagement activities into their vision statements for research, teaching, and service. The new paradigm moves us beyond the traditional what I'll call a one-way model of expert knowledge delivery, extension, and outreach. And in this model, I would use a figure that I think we really need to break through, uh, a figure that we always invoke, which is this idea of a town-gown split. I think we need to break out of that towards a more dynamic two-way approach that emphasizes collaboration, co-creation, and shared authority with public partners. To facilitate this civic turn, to use a term by David Scobie, government funding bodies in Canada and the United States have begun the process of renewing their mandates to support research that engages broader publics in the process of knowledge, production, and dissemination, with particular emphasis on projects that address issues of pressing public concern. And one example of that for uh, on our dais tonight is uh, Patrick Mann's work on water and water policy, an issue that is vitally important. Our panelists today are going to speak to this shift in the arts, culture, the humanities, as well as the social sciences towards programming and initiatives that cultivate open dialogue between our public institutions, such as museums, galleries, arts and heritage organizations, and higher education institutions. Across the artistic disciplines, the conversation has been oriented towards new ideas that might enhance public and community engagement activities. Indeed, Macintosh Gallery recently went through a strategic planning process, and public engagement plays a vital role to that new plan. Like other universities in Canada, Western has recently published a new strategic plan that reaffirms our collective commitment to the public good. From the outset of Achieving Excellence on the World Stage, which is the name of our new plan from 2014, the new mission statement of Western reads as follows. Western creates, disseminates, and applies knowledge for the benefit of society through excellence in teaching, research, and scholarship. Our graduates will be global citizens whose education and leadership will serve the public good. So that's the new mission of Western. At the Canada Council for the Arts, to switch over to the arts, the great funder that emerged mid-century from the massey Levet Commission, public engagement has once again taken center stage in their policy planning. 
They define public engagement as follows, and this is to quote their plan, actively engaging more people in the artistic life of society, notably through attendance, observation, curation, active participation, co-creation, learning, cultural mediation, and creative self-expression. So you can see this concept of public engagement has a conceptual architecture that takes place and activates this principle. The growing prominence of public engagement it is activating across the board at the municipal level in the activities of the London Arts and Heritage Council, so I can see a representative uh, here from both, uh, at the provincial level in the new plan for the Ontario Arts Council, and at the international level in the policies of the National Endowments for the Arts and Humanities in the United States, the British Arts Council, as well as the Australian counterpart, to name only a few. The various definitions and strategic plans and policy reports call attention to the common constitutive elements of mutually beneficial partnerships, shared authority, social responsibility, and collective purposes for a purpose amongst multiple individuals or groups. <coughs> While the traditional idea of outreach situates the scholar, artist, curator, and so forth as the expert who delivers knowledge to the community with a unidirectional approach, the engaged actor participates in a two-way process of exchange, of co-creation to produce knowledge with, for, and by our communities. Given this broader context that I'm trying to outline to situate us today, the question we have to ask ourselves is as follows. How will Western, as well as London arts, culture, and heritage groups advance the civic turn currently taking hold in higher education and the arts across Canada, the United States, and beyond. There's certainly no easy answer to these questions, and there are significant obstacles. For many cultural disciplines, the place of public and community work has yet to receive sufficient institutional recognition and support. Younger scholars and grad students are rarely trained to translate their work to reach broader audiences and forms of engagement, and there remains a widespread resistance on behalf of Canadian universities to include publicly engaged scholarship in considerations for granting promotion and tenure. From the community perspective, universities often feel isolated and disinterested. The mandate of internationalization often seems to look beyond or rub out the local. Sharing authority and knowledge creation can be a challenge and translating or mobilizing knowledge is difficult without first building sustainable, mutually beneficial relationships based on trust and common values. There are certainly fabulous, fabulous, vibrant projects and collaborations currently underway on campus and in the community between Western and London, between Western and many other constituencies. Public history has been doing this for 30 years. But we need to, as a community, do more. Happily, we have a panel of experts today who can help us think through some of these questions. What I'd like to do to start is turn to our panelists for brief introductory remarks, and then we'll see if we can link their contributions together in dialogue. And at the end, of course, we'll have a chance for all of you to ask questions of our panelists. So I'm going to keep my biographical remarks for each of our speakers quite short. Uh, because I'd like to offer as much time as possible for them to speak and to have uh, some dialogue. This is uh, out of order, but I'll point as I go. Professor Stephen Lubar is a Guggenheim Fellow and Professor in the Department of American Studies, History, and the History of Art and Architecture at Brown University. He teaches and advises in Brown's Public Humanities Program, which he directed from 2004 to 2014. Lubar was the chair of the Division of the History of Technology at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. Michelle Hamilton is a public historian whose research focuses on historical and contemporary issues surrounding museums and heritage, social memory, and commemoration, the history of anthropology, cultural identity, and issues of representation and repatriation, usually with regards to First Nations people in Canada. She has a new book out as of next month, so that's hot off the press next month. Still just. I should have uh, had it in my house this morning, apparently. There we go. Well, so I it on the seat. Uh, and it is, uh, the title of the book is Dr. Oren Hayeka. Am I saying that right? Orona Dega. Orona Dega? Yeah. Rodega, Security, Justice, and Equality. Uh, I probably just made a mess of it again trying to make it right. Uh, she is the director of the public history program here at Western. 
Brian Meehan at the end is the executive director and chief curator of Museum London. Prior to this, uh, or to this posting here at Museum London in 2000, he was the director of the Tom Thompson Memorial Art Gallery in Owen Sound, Ontario. Brian has been the chair of the Canadian Art Museum Directors Organization, the Ontario Association of Art Galleries, and the Pillar Nonprofit Network here in London, Ontario. He has been a tremendous community champion of my program, the Public Humanities, since the first day. And I know I speak for many people when I say we are lucky to have Brian here in London as one of our arts leaders. And finally on our dais is Patrick Mann. He's an artist, a, right beside me, a critical writer, curator, and professor of visual arts at Western. His artwork has been exhibited in Canada at Museum London, the Hamilton Art Gallery, the Southern Alberta Art Gallery, and the Museum of Contemporary Canadian Art, Toronto, as well as internationally in recent exhibitions in China and France. And, and finally, at numerous uh, print biennales since the early 1990s. Patrick's collaborative project, Immersion Emergencies and Possible Worlds, resulted in a 10 artist group exhibition, The Source Rethinking Water Through Contemporary Art, presented at Brock University. He has also been a formidably engaged member of the London arts and culture community for many years. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to sit on the panel and talk about this. It's a, a topic that's really important to us at Museum London. Uh, as Josh noted, public engagement is currently an area of emphasis for many public institutions. And this is partly the result of having our funding bodies mandate that we achieve this uh, engagement and uh, also tying their support to that accomplishment. Locally, our municipal government wants to see demonstrable value for the community for its support of cultural institutions. In the current strategic plan and also in the cultural prosperity plan, the city looks to uh, the cultural organizations to provide what they say is amazing arts, culture, and recreation experiences. However, from a funding standpoint, the Grand Theatre, for example, uh, is, uh, receives funding from the city based on a formula that is tied to ticket sales. The quality of the productions is not necessarily a consideration just how many Londoners attend the performances. The province and the federal government want to assure their mandates and agendas are being supported and reflected in the activities of the groups that they fund. And they're becoming increasingly, increasingly explicit as to what communities they would like to see engage. Simone Bro, head of the Canada Council, expressed it quite clearly in a recent interview. As a publicly funded agency, the Council does have public responsibilities. Each Canadian, through his or her taxes, contributes to supporting the arts through our programs. This investment confers upon us the responsibility to be transparent and accountable, and also the duty to contribute to wider public policy goals such as the democratization of culture, economic development, exports, job creation, social well-being, and community building. Funding the arts is ultimately about building the society we want to live in, one that is creative, compassionate, resilient, and prosperous, where citizens can express themselves fully and where all can participate and enjoy artistic creation. Roe believes arts funding must result in public impact. The reality is that our future existence depends on our ability to engage. Funders, whether public or private, individuals or corporate, are not going to be willing to support institutions that are not engaging the very people they profess to. Nor will the public necessarily support institutions where they don't see an attempt to engage or their own experiences and community reflected. But pressure from our funders aside, community engagement is rightly a topic that is top of mind for most of us in the arts and education communities. For many of us, it is the primary reason why we're in the field in the first place. We want people to engage with what we do. There's nothing more satisfying than seeing a museum full of active and engaged visitors. The question, of course, is how do we achieve the engagement in a meaningful way? How do we thoughtfully and su successfully engage our community? And how do we do that without compromising our mandate? Or maybe we should ask, is our current mandate actually what we should be doing? Museum London, as stated in our bylaws, is primarily an educational institution. 
rather than a place of entertainment or recreation. Although one could and should argue that those aren't mutually exclusive. However, this does influence how we carry out our responsibilities. Achieving increased public engagement comes with institutional challenges. Although we tend to think not, when push comes to shove, many, of, many in our organization are still operating under an older conception of who we are and are more inward rather than outward focused in their ambitions. They don't realize or they haven't embraced the idea that we are in the public service sector. Over the years, we have certainly internalized a way of thinking about museums that can be counterproductive to achieving engagement. The friction that occurs between the curatorial and public engagement, between the rigors of education and the participatory, are areas of potential conflict and philosophical dispute. And there are also reasons to manage change cautiously. As is often the case, change is often a fight over resources. Given that the increased resources from one aspect for one aspect of the museum's activities has to come from somewhere else. Or at least that's the perception and the anticipated result of any change. Some of the pushback from the move to greater engagement comes from the uncertainty of what it will look like when the museum is not the authority in what it presents to the public. How comfortable are we in engaging the public in the creation of exhibitions, in deciding on what we collect? What does shared authority actually look like? And how do we get the curators and registrars more engaged themselves in the bigger picture necessary for cultural institutions to remain relevant? How comfortable are we with experimentation? And where do we draw the line? It is important that our funders and our public challenge us and demand that we change. Our task is to find creative ways to accomplish this while still feeling that we're offering exhibitions, collections, and programs that have a certain rigor. We know it'd be quite easy to engage the public with populist offerings, but we also believe that that ultimately does a disservice to all. Even though we have come some way in terms of our public engagement as a core principle for what we do, uh, we've made attempts recently with some of our partnerships and activities, and I'd like to mention a, a couple of them uh, here very quickly. Words is an office festival that uh, we do at the museum that's in its third year. It's a partnership between the London Public Library, the Public Humanities Program, Fanshawe College, the museum, and a number of community partners. It presents sessions with some of Canada's best writers, but also involves a book fair where local self-published authors can promote their work and participate in workshops. And in the past, we have woven visual arts and maker groups from the community into this mix. Although it is not necessarily core to our mandate as a visual arts and history museum, it supports our goal of making the museum a cultural hub that presents all forms of art. Public Matters is an annual speaker series that is a partnership with Public Humanities at Western and presents a lecture by a notable arts professional at Museum London. This takes what could easily be presented on campus to a much broader public with topics chosen that would be of interest to both communities. Our satellite gallery project on Dundas Street, which we operate with Fanshawe College, Beale Arts, and Western University, is a gallery space that allows us to go beyond our four walls and be more responsive and experimental in our exhibition programming. It allows us to support initiatives that we would not have been able to schedule at the museum, show artists that might not otherwise have had the opportunity with us, and do so at a very accessible venue. And an internal example of a community engagement activity has been the interactive project coordinated by London filmmaker Juan Bello, who I'm pleased to see is in the front row here today, uh, entitled Click Panoramic Americas. This project aims to expand dialogue between artists in the Trans Americas exhibition currently on at the museum and the public by assembling photographs both online and in the gallery that are submitted by the public through, throughout the run of the exhibition. As a community art project, it references participatory events in Latin America beginning in the middle of the 20th century. Using the art of connecting people, such performance encouraged dialogue, or as Argentinian sociologist Roberto Jacobi has described, instigated a technology of friendship. In some ways, this might be the most significant of the four examples, as it signals a genuinely different and I think successful way of sharing our space and which I think may have the greatest impact on our organization going forward. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. 
I'm uh, just getting over a cold, so hopefully my voice will be um, I want to, uh, I guess, start with something that um, Josh mentioned in his introduction when he was um, talking about public history, and that's that um, uh, public history here at Western uh, began in uh, the mid uh, 1980s, and we've been doing some of this um, collaborative work since then, although certainly I was not here then. Uh, but um, if we look back at the history of public history as a discipline, uh, some of the terms that we, that universities are now um, putting into their strategic plans or um, some of the funding agencies are using, uh, while they're different terminology, are actually fundamental uh, key underpinnings to our discipline. Um, so for instance, um, the SHRC, the Social Sciences and Communities Research Council, which funds most Canadian scholars, uh, scientists, is both the blessing and curse of all academics. Uh, um, those of you applying will know what I mean. Uh, now use words or terms such as knowledge mobilization. Well, uh, when you read their description, um, as I did when I was applying for a knowledge mobilization grant a few years ago, I realized that uh, it was not that difficult to put public history into that. What we do is largely, a part of what we do is largely knowledge mobilization, which is, um, although it is uh, largely one way, um, an exchange of information sometimes, uh, is to take um, historical research um, and to translate it in a way uh, which interests the public, engage the public, and um, in different venues outside of universities, whether that's museum exhibits, walking tours, tourism, historic cemeteries, whatever uh, it applies. Um, we also, uh, when we read the uh, short definitions, they talk about co-creation of knowledge, and this is where we get into the two-way process. This is also something that public history um, has done um, uh, since its founding. The, the discipline was really um, founded in the 1800s, but it was not called public history itself until really the 1970s. I can talk more about that later if that's of interest. Uh, but co-creation of knowledge or real collaboration with communities was also part of public history. And that was really sitting down with community partners and saying, um, let's start at the beginning of this project together, um, rather than uh, a one-way process in, we want to do this, would you like to participate, or would you like to um, evaluate what we've done, or would you like to come in and, and tell us how to make it better? Um, the co-creation of knowledge is two, two groups or more sitting down and coming up with the goals and the outlines of the project from the beginning, so that you do have this shared authority or shared meaning um, in the end result, because both partners were there at the beginning to define the ultimate project, rather than one partner defining the project and then bringing it to the other and saying, hey, how would you like to collaborate? Um, shared authority is a term that comes from public history as well, uh, more specifically oral history. Uh, I think it first appeared in a book by Michael Frisch in the 1980s, who's a famous oral historian um, who has written a, um, many other books since, since that one, um, but is considered a, a, a quite um, a, a, a classic read in the field of oral history. Um, so, um, in some ways, uh, I think that universities and uh, funding agencies are just catching up with us. Um, uh, and um, I mean, you know, uh, some of the projects that we've worked on, um, when Brian was talking, it actually came to mind a project we did with Museum London, um, which I think in some ways was one of our most community-based ones, um, in parts anyway. We did an exhibit, a uh, student student exhibit, a traditional museum exhibit on the theme of labor uh, with a local history twist. Uh, for those of, no, those of you who know London history, uh, the 19th century had quite an industrial uh, background. We had um, quite a lot of manufacturing factories and so on, and as a result, there's quite a lot of objects in Museum London's collection. So in one ways, that was a very traditional exhibit. We did a catalog, which again is very traditional, um, although the students were the curators. Uh, not, uh, not Museum London staff. But there were elements that were really um, even more publicly engaged. For instance, uh, we had uh, one of our programs, um, because there used to be a knitting factory in London, uh, some of the, one of the public programs was to bring in a knitting group. 
um, that was um, a contemporary knitting group, and uh, they sat around and knitted um, in the display while we talked about historical um, manufacturing of knitted goods, um, uh, which I thought was very creative. Um, another part of that exhibit um, was to put out a call for the public to send us photos um, and uh, about manufacturing or factories or buildings in London. And this happened to be at the time when uh, the economy in Canada, in particular in London, was in decline. Manufacturing was pulling out of London. Um, some of the uh, factory, factory companies that had been in London for 100 years or so were disappearing. Um, and so there was a lot of abandoned buildings um, that were happening, that were, were, were still around. Um, we're still trying to find uses for some of those buildings. And so we got a lot of wonderful pictures of, say, um, the Kellogg's factory, which was, um, uh, I think, either abandoned or was in the process of it, but it has a giant um, K in red on it. And someone sent us a beautiful photo of the K lit up at night um, with sort of this um, empty building in, in the background. And it, it sort of brought together both history of London, because Kellogg's was a, was a really important company in London. It brought together the artifacts. But it also brought um, a very real economic um, and social issue that was happening in London at the time, um, that um, our employment rate, I think, at the time was the highest. Unemployment rate was the highest at the time in London um, of all of Ontario, um, because we were losing these manufacturing jobs. Um, and um, so it was sort of this wonderful mix of um, contemporary social issues, uh, people you know, sending us these wonderful photos and so on. Um, and um, although I, I must say that the timing of the exhibit, la labor, um, had, you know, we planned it a year in advance. We didn't know the economy was going <laughs> was to go down. Now. Um, but one of, the, one of the challenges I threw out to the students in the beginning of September, most of them who were not from London and don't, didn't know London history or London or the current London economy was like, this is our opportunity to actually turn a historical exhibition, do that, but also comment on um, the problems that we have today. And, and uh, we ended up doing oral history interviews with people who had, who had become unemployed. Um, from these uh, factories, and that was part of the exhibit about how tough it was um, to have been employed for 20, 25 years uh, and to be given early retirement or to be bought out or to seek um, uh, jobs in, in the city um, if you didn't want to move. Uh, so that sort of just came to mind when Brian was talking. Um, some of the barriers. Um, I've learned a great deal about this over my years um, as director of public history. And um, part of it is I think that while the university, the strategic plan that Josh has quoted and Shirk and, and all their funding bodies are coming online, I'm unsure whether the larger institutions and funding bodies really understand <coughs> how much time and money and effort it takes to actually do public engagement properly. Um, it was mentioned, Josh, I think you mentioned, for instance, that you can't just show up in a community and say, hey, we want to work with you, or show up at an institution which is already understaffed and underfunded and say, uh, how would you like to have 10 students work with you? Um, because they're, you know, they are gaining a wonderful project. On the other, on the other hand, they are taking on the mentorship, teaching, and questions, emails of students who are trying to figure out this process for the likely for the first time, um, you know, by themselves. And it's a lot of work to ask um, community partners to do this. Uh, and if you're talking about real grassroots public groups, those people may be just volunteers um, who uh, you know do programs because they love what they're doing, but they have Monday to Friday jobs. Um, and they are, um, you know, they, they do it because they love it, but we're really, uh, in some ways, have to be careful of not burdening those organizations. Um, and, and not just think of it as we're sending you free labor. Um, we are also asking something of them. We're asking for their time to mentor the, the students or whoever properly. Um, and not all groups can do it um, uh, because they just don't have the resources. Um, and um, the last thing I'll say um, is that 
Um, and this is, it comes from my own work, less, less from my teaching work, more from my own research, is that there are particular communities which have a greater stake in public engagement. And here I'm thinking of my own work with First Nations people, uh, with museums or telling um, their stories, uh, or uh, for instance, examples that are now coming out about telling uh, the stories about residential schools and how to commemorate um, those stories. Um, it's, it's particularly, there's different challenges. Um, they certainly are very uh, wary of um, any project of which they're not um, involved in from the beginning to help define the goals. Uh, they might call it decolonizing um, the project. Um, so they don't, they're not very interested in being consulted. They want to co-create knowledge. They, uh, want to be true collaborative partners. Um, again, there's challenges with time and money. Most of these individuals um, are not historians or belong to historical societies. They're members of the public who have a daily job doing something else, and they do this on their own time because they think that educating the Canadian public about residential schools or, or whatever the topic may be is important, um, particularly for children. Um, uh, so again, there's a sense of time there, which we're trying, we have an academic timeline, um, which is fairly rigid. Um, communities have a different timeline, and which may be much longer, um, one which revolves around their own personal uh, work schedule. Um, but also that we, we don't treat them as free labor either. Um, that we recognize their um, different kind of knowledge, their indigenous knowledge, as equally valuable as academic or historical knowledge gained from research, and that um, we somehow compensate them for that, um, even if it's just an honorarium. But all those things need to be built in. And, and I, I guess my question is, um, this sounds very cynical, but my, my question is, is that, um, you know, do the institutions that want us to do this really uh, understand how much time and money and resources it takes, how difficult it is to do it, and are they really willing to support us in doing it properly? Because we can do it badly, um, but I don't think there's any point in that. So, and I'll stop there, because I can go on. That's great. I first want to thank everybody at Western who's been so friendly and uh, had such a pleasure talking to people today, but especially Josh and Michelle for setting this up and, and uh, spending a day touring around with me, so I appreciate it. I'm going to, to try something a little bit different. Um, I'm going to give you my, my set of seven rules for public humanities. Uh, this is something I came up with mostly talking to students, trying to teach them, you know, what is it that, that what are the rules to follow? And some of them are a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but mostly it's, you know, this is some of the ways to think about your work. And rule number one, which may actually be a good rule for life in general, is it's not about you. Um, it's not what you want or your discipline wants or the university needs or wants, but it's about what the people outside the university, the communities that you're working with, need and want. So it's not, we're from the university and we're here to help, or my old job, we're from the government and we're here to help, uh, but rather, what are you already doing and how can we participate, or how can we be useful to you? Um, so it's not, and this is repeating what Michelle said in some ways, it's not about teaching people facts that we already know, it's about a dialogue of a sharing and language that everybody's been using, the language sharing of authority and knowledge and expertise. So first one, it's not about you. Second one is about the roles that public humanities, public humanists play. Um, I do an exercise with PhD students sometimes, making a list of what is it that they bring to public humanities work. Uh, and what we end up coming up with um, is that they're, they need to be facilitators and translators as well as experts. What you learn as a PhD student in, say, history or many fields is how to be an expert. And that's only one of the things that you need to know in public humanities. So if you're sharing authority with, a, with an audience, with a community, um, what you're doing is not saying, here's what you need to know. It's saying, 
can we provide a place in which stories can be shared, in which points of view can be shared? Um, can we provide a place up front where, the, where we discuss first what the rules are for that engagement? Um, in some ways, the model that, that is useful to think about is Web 2.0. That is, we want a place where everybody gets to engage uh, making a two-way conversation. I should say this is not an easy conversation to have, but it's an important conversation to start with, because otherwise it's very easy to fall back into we're the experts rather than we're here to, 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 to facilitate and work with you. Uh, that balance is an important part of every project. Uh, rule number three is scholarship starts with public engagement. Um, it's not that public engagement comes after scholarship, but it's part of the scholarship. Uh, so there's a debate in public humanities about the right name for the field. Should it be applied humanities? Or the one that's coming in the fashion a little bit is translational humanities. So the sciences, especially the biomedical sciences right now, are very uh, much, in, much like the word translational science, which means we develop stuff in the lab and we figure out a way to, to commercialize it, to get it out to the public. And I don't like that as a model for, for the public humanities. Um, it's not that we do our normal scholarly work in our usual ways and then convert it somehow, translate it somehow for the public. Um, the model that I like to point to, and it's a good place to talk about this, is the transformation of public art from what it was in the 1970s, which very much was an artist does a uh, piece of work and sort of springs it on the community. Here's this thing, we're going to put it in the public square, uh, appreciate it as public art, to a much different model of public art that is common today, which is an uh, art of community involvement and interaction. It's not just for the public, it comes from the public. Uh, so my question really is, what would humanity scholarship, if it developed like public art does out of conversation, um, what if a humanities department was a hub of community for artists, educators, scholars, and the public? So rule number four, um, communities define community. So the word that we talk most about in public humanities class is this word community. We throw it out there right away and everybody says, yes, yes, we're all in community. And then we spend a lot of time trying to define what that means. Um, my sense on this, and this is not something that everyone in the field agrees with, is that Communities get to define themselves rather than we get to define them. Uh, that means that it's often best to work with existing community organizations than trying to invent community organizations. Uh, we should be going out there and saying, here's what we're interested in, you are now our community. Rather, there's a community out there that we work with. Um, to give you a little bit of the pushback against that, it does mean that we end up sometimes with a rather anodyne sort of public humanities. We don't pick out topics that people don't want us to talk about. We don't sometimes talk between communities. We sort of, sort of talk to the people who already care about the issues that we're talking about. And that, that's an issue that is worth thinking about. Uh, number five of my rules for public humanities is work with artists. Um, the most, one of the liberating things you can do as a scholar is to say what I'm doing is art rather than scholarship. It's a very freeing move. Artists, uh, especially recently, the kind of relational uh, aesthetics, the community practice arts, are very good at saying we are performing something, we're not teaching something. Um, you can become part of the community culture as, as art and working with artists in a way that's hard to do in a purely scholarly kind of way. Uh, number six is to think digital. Um, digital public humanities opens up immediate kinds of access uh, for outreach. But it's not just outreach. It's, you don't want to say we 
do our work and we put it online and therefore it's public humanities work. The notion is how can we open up the processes of our work digitally so that we are open about the, as we do the work, it's available to the public. It's not just at the end. So every step along the way, you can say, this is open. You can see what we're thinking about. We're not hiding things. Uh, join us. Comment along the way. You can often get a lot out of that. And, and finally, um, humanists need practical skills. Um, universities, PhD programs in the humanities should be teaching different kinds of skills for students who are going to work with them. Um, we should assume that you just pick that up along the way. You're, you're trained to, to be an academic, and by the way, you should be able to talk to the community at the same time. But there's really practical skills, everything from oral history to, to management of cultural institutions that is essential to the work that we're going to need to do. And that PhD programs, if they're serious about producing scholars that are also public scholars, need to say that's part of the training you get. Uh, it's not just on the side or something you pick up after you're done being indoctrinated as, a, as an academic. So those are my seven rules of things that I hope um, students pick up if they're going to go into the field. And rules can sort of engage and guide their work as public humanists. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you, Josh, for inviting me, and uh, thank you to all the panelists for their contributions, which I've really appreciated. Uh, speaking as someone who's worked in the university in various capacities, both academic and administrative, and as an artist and a volunteer in the community, I'm interested in the ways I see us becoming more interdependent, uh, both for purposes of survival and because I think some of the old paradigms around expertise and specialization have and are giving way to newer collaborative and interdisciplinary models of practice and cooperation, as Josh has alluded. And given the gravity with which I would like to speak, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the, the projects that we've, we've been involved in in visual arts at Western as academics and artists. And I'm going to use the rubrics reaching out, reaching in, and reaching across. So the first uh, reaching out project, actually Brian mentioned, and that's the satellite project space, which is a, a small gallery project downtown. It's a community uh, project gallery that sets up a collaboration among high school, college, university, and museum professionals and the students involved in the respective academic institutions. We've needed to be light on our feet uh, and adaptive, and as a result, we've seen Satellite develop a mutually benefiting group of producers and an audience, and also foster, foster internships, professional practice by the coordinator, and also enable, as Brian said, community artists and others to engage publicly. And so it has, I think by nature, because we've needed to be adaptable, we've also done a lot of different kinds of things that uh, came our way. In terms of reaching in, I think because we're working on a real bare bones budget, we've had to capitalize on the existing resources of the institutions, whether those be professional or material, so that the project didn't need to be invented from the ground up. Basically, I have a salary, the university has resources, and we've been able to capitalize on those kinds of things so that we didn't need to bring a lot of real money to the table. Another um, reaching out uh, example would be our internships. And they happen in our department at both the undergraduate level as well as the master's level. And we cooperate with a number of local institutions, Museum London, the Macintosh Gallery, the Museum of Ontario Archaeology, DNA Gallery, among others. In this case, I think the reaching out involves our students gaining the expertise of professionals at the institutions, initially shadowing staff, and eventually actively working alongside, as many have curatorially or in curatorially related roles at all those institutions. And I see the institutions reaching in 
uh, to our base of intellectual engagement when students help to produce content. So for example, at Museum London, uh, one of our students worked on a program to be taken out to senior centers at the Museum of Ontario Archaeology. They worked to help build the data around the collection and made exhibition proposals, at least one of which has recently been used uh, to produce an exhibition. At DNA, the intern wrote an accompanying essay for an exhibition of books and book-related works. And here at the Macintosh, the intern conducted an interview with an artist whose work was being featured, and that was published online. In all those cases, I think the students, sometimes in consultation with their professors, brought value to the institution at a time when we know that professionals are often really stretched to find the time to produce some of the content. And I know from talking to museum curators that one of the things they often don't have time to do is to write. Um, and then a third um, example that I'll talk about is really a little bit more personal, and this is around artists engaging students. And so in my own experience, um, we do, as an artist, I'm working in the university, but also in my studio, to produce professional level programs, uh, whether for the use of the university or a wider audience. And I see um, the kind of activity that I do as being able to become a springboard for our students to be involved in larger initiatives as a form of what I would call reaching across the faculty-student divide, if you will. So in my own case, um, the exhibition Baroque Nova, which happened here at the Macintosh Gallery and in a couple of other galleries. Uh, the project Josh mentioned, Immersion Emergencies, that yielded to an exhibition at uh, Rodman Hall. And then a recent project, uh, uh, Ecuador Canada collaboration with an exhibition called Mountains and Rivers Without End. Uh, those were all SHRC funded projects, and they all involved students in planning and, in some cases, exhibiting their work. Other faculty from our department, Kelly Jazvak, for example, um, has involved students in her very active career, most recently for Nuit Blanche. And as well, my colleague, another example, Kirsty Robertson, parlayed her Radical Museums course into a series of papers presented at a graduate conference. And I know that James is currently working with Sarah Basnet on a show on the Cold War, and so students are having hands-on experience in developing a project both intellectually and materially. So I'm keeping this really brief, and I'm gonna end by posing a question, and that is, how can we imagine transposing what are often ad hoc and temporary collaborations that mutually benefit institutions and their stakeholders into more sustainable entities? Or is this a reasonable or even a desirable aspiration? Are we better off working on temporary and often short-term collaborations? Or should we be, lo be looking for longer-term partnerships? So, thank you. Uh, really compelling themes, and you can see the crossovers that are taking place between a number of the papers. One of the things that I really pulled out, there's a number of things that maybe I can cross over um, amongst our panelists and maybe get some comments back, is uh, what happens too when we get, uh, you can think of the old Thomas Kuhn idea of, of paradigm change. When you shift one from one paradigm to the next, you see the old paradigm grasping desperately to the paradigm that it knows. <laughs> And we see this manifesting in the tensions that Brian mentioned between curator and that participatory or democratizing ethos that when do we, how do we surrender authority? We're seeing it with, with the way that Michelle described um, the uh, working with sometimes vulnerable communities, sometimes communities that are, are understaffed. Uh, we see it in doctoral education. Um, we're having a debate at Western right now as to how do we shift doctoral training so it includes different artifacts, so it includes more professional development. But when you pitch this to professors who have a real stake in the old paradigm, you watch the tyranny of the minority on committees shut ideas down very quickly. Um, and this, this happens, I imagine, too, in, in, in different practices uh, in artistic disciplines as well, where there's a traditional model. My question would be, how do we overcome some of these resistances? How do you treat a resistant faculty member? Because sometimes you could go with, I'll go ignore, and, and that, that'll be fine, we'll just go our own way. But sometimes that's an impossible scenario. So I suppose the question for all of our panelists is, how, do we, how does one uh, encounter or confront or negotiate those tensions that come up when we see this shift uh, from, from an older model into a newer model? It's a difficult question, I realize. Well, I, 
would start, I would say, show them a good, if you're at a university, show them a good student. Um, you know, so often when you meet the students and, and, they're, and, and you sense their palpable enthusiasm and their brilliance, um, you realize that this is a huge resource that we, we need to be, frankly, capitalizing on. And, and I think that there's, you know, we're, we're all trying to sort of move our models of education into more collaborative ways of learning. I mean, we know the students are learning so much from each other today, and always were, but now we're actually recognizing it. So I think that uh, it doesn't need to mean that when we engage the students that our expertise goes out the window. But I think it just means that a lot of times the kind of expertise the students themselves actually acquire comes from the sort of digging that they can do and we can supplement and, and support that, but we actually don't have to be threatened by the fact that some of that work can be given to them. Mm -hmm. That's certainly the model that, that I work with, um, which both um, <coughs> Uh, at, the at the beginning, scares the students, and then, and then later on, they, they learn to take um, control of it. But many of the projects that we do, um, in most of the decisions are left up to the students. Um, and I become, rather than an instructor, uh, more like a project manager, I guess is how I describe it. Um, and um, students can be very comfortable with that at first because they're not, especially in history, when they're not used to doing that, that kind of work they're used to. Uh, in their undergraduate education sitting, um, you know, maybe at archives or library or at home with a stack of books and thinking on their own, writing on their own, uh, perhaps, um, perhaps in some upper level courses, other students are commenting on drafts of papers, which is also nerve wracking. Um, so every September, you know, I, I see the fear on their faces, but they think, well, uh, we're in charge of this. Uh, and I'm like, yes, this is a good thing. Um, and usually by October, November, and I'm talking to the people <laughs> here, which you may or may not be there yet, I don't know. Um, but eventually, most of them come to realize we can do this, um, we want to do this, and what we hear from our, um, our students about student internships, and what we hear afterwards is that our students not only um, have read about how to do something, they know how to do something. And they're also more confident because they, we, we've had them make decisions about budgets and content and um, other things like that. So that being said, um, you know, if it all goes wrong, I encourage them to change their decisions. Uh, I don't let them, you know, it's not sink or swim. Um, but I, uh, you know, there is a relative degree of authority that I give to the students um, as a uh, as a method of training, really, because when they are at the job, they will have to control budgets um, and maybe cut something to be able to, you know, do some another part, or maybe, uh, you know, a wonderful idea happens halfway through the project, or a problem arises, and you think, okay, I've got to change this somehow, and you need to go over the punches, and those are all good um, lessons to learn, um, and it's, you know, when you learn it at the university, it's kind of a safer place to learn than on you know, your first job. But it goes back to what Stephen was saying, was learn, learn practical skills. And some of that is not historical skills particularly. It's project management skills, it's budgeting skills, it's um, learning confidence in your decision making, it's good team building skills, um, things that are not specific to any discipline really. Mm -hmm. Can we add to that? So much of make what is important for public humanists to understand it turns out to be just what the rest of the world wants employees to do. Yes. So if, if you're, I mean, most of our students do not belong to, to museum curators or, or to teach to the academics, they do all sorts of other things. And what you need for that is work together in groups, be able to make the case and you know, make your argument verbally and in writing. Um, be able to switch between content and project understanding and the, the, the financial side of things, that, you know, be able to make all those things. And so you can make the case back to the university that in fact, for most of the students, history or humanities can become a very useful kind of undergraduate training, graduate training for people who go into lots of different ways, lots of different fields. And that 
it's much more like the real world to, to work on a group project than it is to, to write a paper that only your professors ever going to read. And so you, you can make a case for being useful beyond just the, the kind of work we're talking about here. Well, and I think from an institutional standpoint, um, there's obviously such a need for leadership to, to, to buy into the idea that, that it works. And then from there, um, convince, um, cajole, um, and you know, if nothing else works, force um, uh, the staff to, to embrace the projects. And, and uh, I think you know, the, the, the ones that I've seen that really embody this, this direction inevitably have, have elements of success to them. And even if they're not totally successful, there's, there's great things that come out of them. And you know, it's only somebody who's so blinkered that they refuse to see those kind of successes and, and the, the, uh, the reasons for doing it that, that are going to stand in the way. I think, I think this process works because more often than not, it proves it works. And so I think you know, just as long as the institution forces itself to move in that direction, I think through those successes, you then create a, a culture that embraces that. Absolutely. And leadership is very linked to mentorship. I had a question, too. You, you, mentorship is a theme that I, I can turn to Patrick for what you're talking about. One of the things I know that you take very seriously uh, in your work, and, and I imagine for artists and for students to, to think through this, is this uh, hyphenation of identities that sometimes comes with public work. So citizen artist uh, is something that you you model to many artists that don't necessarily know what that looks like yet because there aren't as many models as maybe the traditional. Uh, has the idea of being a citizen artist always been something for you? Did you have to grow into that? How did that become something that you do and that you work with your students to demonstrate? Um, <clears throat> well, actually, one thing I was going to follow up uh, with just on the last yeah, question, and then I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll pick up on that. Um, I was just going to echo what Stephen said earlier, and that is work with artists. Because the thing that we recognized more recently as the whole humanities area is trying to become more public and, and more engaged in the community, that of course we've been doing that forever. And teaching our students not only to make the work, but figure out a way to get it out in public, promote the work, you know, basically drive the bus to the opening if they have to. And so there's a way in which, you know, some of what seems like sort of secondary activity can be quite primary in, in teaching art students. And so I think a lot of the, the kinds of skill sets that they come out of uh, art training with actually are quite adaptive. And so often they, they, you know, they do fairly well in, in, in these um, institutional contexts. I think this idea of the citizen artist um, I'll just say, tell you a really quick story. I worked in the north um, in the 1980s in an Inuit community, and at one point I asked um, William Noah, who was an artist, a very important artist, um, I asked him about his father, who was also an important artist. I said, well, you know, how did your father know that he was an artist, or how did he get recognized? And he said, well, he was a great hunter, he was a great leader, so therefore he was a great artist. And it struck me that our idea, our modern idea, of the artist as this kind of specialist outsider, usually, um, you know, is, is so specific to our sort of Western post-enlightenment mentality. And it really, it, it, it doesn't exist everywhere in that same way. And so, you know, in that context and in others, it just struck me that you know, artists shouldn't be the last people to be able to speak about their work. And I'm very proud of Rahab, who's sitting in the front row here, who speaks very eloquently about her work. You know, there, on the one hand, we do need some of the, the sort of um, structures. We need lots of the structures of the museum where we have expertise and we have curators who can stand back and look at what artists are doing and actually talk about it. But that doesn't mean artists can't also talk about what they do. And so I think that, you know, my belief is that we can't all do everything. 
But some artists definitely should be also leaders in the community because I think some of the ways they may be thinking about what the community needs may be a little different from what the politicians may be thinking about, that sort of thing. Um, I don't want to say every boardroom needs an artist. You know, I think that that's become the sort of cliche of how to, how to employ artists and teach people to think outside the box. I think you know, that, that's a, a little in, inappropriate, but I definitely think artists certainly can do their work, but they can, they can also speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. I had a question to follow up that with, uh, with Stephen. I'm going to quote something that you written, had written a couple years ago about when you were asked a question about graduate education. We, we've spoken a lot about student experience and, and developing younger artists and younger talent. Um, and the question was about humanities PhD education in relationship to jobs, to museums, um, and curatorship. And you had written, not, not uh, only do graduate history programs teach the wrong things from museum work, they don't teach the right things. Research methodology plays surprisingly small role in a surprisingly small role in training. You pick it up along you, as you go. Material and visual culture training uh, is rare in PhD programs. Working with or for the public is almost non-existent. Indeed, at many schools, it's frowned upon. Learning to work in cooperative groups or with new media or with people in other disciplines is not part of the training. This may, this may make for good professors, and you parenthetically write, I don't think so, but that's another <laughs> topic. <laughs> uh, but it makes for bad museum workers. It teaches students to look inward, not outward, to be solitary, not social. It teaches them to care about what others in the academy want and disconnects them from what is outside the field. It emphasizes all of the all of the things that set history apart from the public, while the museum uh, works quite the opposite with staff that need to make history interesting to the public. And I find this really compelling because I think you could say the exact same thing about humanities education, PhD education, whether it's in literature or philosophy. Uh, and indeed, I'm sure we could find ways to articulate that in social sciences as well. So I wonder um, if, if we're not at a place where PhD education, uh, are we not now at a place where all all PhDs should be educated in such a way that they should be able to speak to broader publics. Whether or not there's the anticipation that they'll go out into that world, should this now become something that many PhD programs do? So that was part of a grant. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was a long debate that I lost, actually. Um, I was trying to convince museums that they shouldn't be hiring PhDs as curators. Not art museums. Art museums are really difficult. But the history museums. His, history PhD training does not make for good history museum trip. So that, that was really the, the argument I was making, and I was particularly addressing that to the Smithsonian, which was in a little debate about that. And I lost that battle. Um, but I decided that it was more important to have the prestige than the skills that the curators really needed. And I understand. So that, that's, that's where that was coming from. I do think. And this is just a purely practical kind of argument for, for graduate education. In the history profession right now, history PhDs, roughly a third of them go into teaching history. Uh, that's a pretty small number. It means that two thirds of them go into doing other things. And in fact, they do really well at those other things. It's not, I don't think that's a bad thing, but that they would do better at those other things as well as maybe at teaching if they knew to work together better, if they, they knew to talk to the public, if they were trained <coughs> less in historiography and more in methodology, maybe. maybe. Yeah. Um, and I think, in fact, this is starting to happen. Uh, again, I only know the history side of this, not the literature side, but it seems to me that many history departments, in part because the job market is so bad, in part because the number of majors in history is down, yeah. that they are starting to think about rather than individual projects, group projects. Yeah. That they're starting to think about public presentation as part of their work. Um, I, just, I don't think that every, I don't think every professor or every student needs to do this all the time. I'm sort of in some ways my I'm an old-fashioned elitist in, in some areas, and it's fine that sometimes you do things that are 
only going to be read by the, the few people who subscribe to your journal, and that seems fair. But to only be able to do that, or only care about that, does seem to be a mistake, especially if you're hoping to have a broader impact in the world, if you're hoping to, uh, or even just sort of resigned to saying, I'm probably not going to be teaching at a R1 research university. I guess I should be able to do other things as well. And so in some ways, that's a plea for that that broader training yeah. rather than an hour of training. That's great. And I'm going to link on to a question to, to Michelle about the public history programs. Mm -hmm. Public history programs, MA programs, like the, the one that you, you, you uh, instructed from, they do provide skills that would put people in positions quickly into, into that area. And yet we still encounter this division between the academic and the public history component, and it's still a resistant point. If it's the case that our undergraduate students are doing so well to go to a, uh, an MA, which we still insist upon, upon calling a terminal MA rather than an MA, uh, a professional oh, MA. Call it that MA. <laughs> not, 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 not this universe. Why do you think that there's still this resistance to to the idea of Oh, you really want to get me going over <laughs> uh, um, Okay, well I have a few answers for that, I guess. Um, uh, some of this some of this debate I think is really old. Um, and goes back to at least in Canada, um, perhaps also in the United States, but I can't I can't really say that with any authority. Um, but in Canada, uh, in the 19th century, the people who did history uh, were the public. They were the ones that joined historical societies that were grassroots. They were the ones that founded museums, genealogical societies, collected archival materials, did research, saved a lot of stuff <coughs> from being destroyed, although you could also argue they saved a lot of unimportant stuff that now museums are trying to get rid of. Um, it's a different issue. Um, but they were the ones that, um, and it was largely middle class, so I can't, can't say it was, um, you know, everyone. Um, but it was certainly more democratic, I guess, um, to use a word we used already, than, it, than, uh, than university historians. And then in Canada, uh, in, the in the 1920s, the Canadian Historical Association, which we still have today as our professional organization, formed. And it was a mix. It was more diverse than it is now. It was a mix of um, uh, some of these historical society members, um, some people who were museum or archival workers. Many of them weren't trained because there was nowhere to train in those disciplines in Canada. Um, and some of them were beginning to be the very few historians who taught at universities. And as time went on, the CHA became more and more specialized, more and more representing those trained in by universities for people at universities, and now wholly, really, the membership now is, I mean, it's got to be over 90% of people who teach at universities, who have PhDs. Um, and so the museum, um, you know, uh, people who join the CHA or the historical society people or the museum people form, form their own organizations, like the Canadian Museum Association, because they felt that the professionals, and very rightly so, that the professionals were saying, you are amateur um, historians. So amateur is a, you know, was meant to be derogatory um, in the sense of you don't have a PhD or you've not been to university, you don't have specialized training of whatever kind. Um, and it's much like this debate between, you know, do you need a PhD to be a museum curator? Um, and they went their separate ways in Canada, and they've never really come back again. And there's this ongoing struggle within the Canadian Historical Association. There's many affiliated groups, like the Labor History Group, the Women's History Group, the Native History Group. And those are groups of people who are interested in a particular topic or theme or, or, or geographic area who meet sometimes or sponsor papers or panels um, within the annual meeting. The public history group of the CHA has uh, struggle to stay alive. Um, I, I don't even know whether I would use the word alive to describe it. Um, and it, um, it, and because there's two constituents that belong to it. There are the public historians who teach at universities, of which there's very few, um, about PhDs. And then there are the people who, uh, for lack of maybe a better word, call practitioners. 
um, who work in um, you know, the federal government at Parks Canada, who work at National Museums, some which may have PhDs, some which may not, um, or archival workers. And um, they do not get along. And they're in the same um, And that divide is there. But I think it's a long standing divide that's over 100 years old. That divide is also in university departments. Um, there's very few public history programs that are in Canada. Um, I think this is true in the United States because when I go to the National Council on Public History annual meetings, I hear other public history directors uh, from the United States talking about this. That uh, those blinkers, to use Brian's word, um, see public history as derivative of a real history. So that um, the idea that translating and facilitating things, um, which is part of public history, is secondary to what the core of the history training is, which is good, good solid traditional archival research, doing, or, you know, writing something original that no one's ever heard of before, um, and publishing it, um, which is often you know, read, again, by very few people, as Stephen has mentioned. And so um, the idea of taking something, a topic that's already known, and translating or facilitating it or transforming it into a museum exhibit or a walking tour is seen as derivative. And derivative is meant to be, again, a derogatory term. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm very conscious of every project that my students do starts with archival research. So that I can say it is not derivative here. Um, they learn all the traditional um, skills of a history of A, critical thinking, writing, archival research, but the product is going to be different. It contains that translation, the facilitation, whatever you want to call it. The other part of my answer is that um, in, the, in the last maybe five years, maybe longer, maybe shorter, I'm not sure, there's been a lot of talk of the Plan B, and this is both in Canada and the United States, and I, I find the term um, in some ways, Ben House being used highly offensive. Um, because, um, and this is to build on what Stephen said earlier, is that um, to assume that someone with a PhD in history can just, you know, who can't, uh, and the, I think one third for Canada is generous, people who might get jobs, I think it's probably, history jobs is probably more like 10%. Yeah. Um, these days, is that, uh, <laughs> sort of, uh, <laughs> that um, uh, they do end up in other jobs, and I think that's fabulous. However, to assume that because they have a, his a, a history PhD that's very traditional, they can automatically become a public historian, I find highly offensive, because a public historian knows all the things um, from the traditional historical world, but they have all these other things, um, and they need those other things. And we specifically train them in those things for that reason. Um, and to suggest that you should pick them up on the job or just you know, regular PhD training means that you can go out and deliver a talk to the public that they find interesting, I think is wrong. There are people, yes, who can do it, and they can pick it up on the job. But to suggest that, um, plan, well, I don't find plan B the term offensive because it suggests that plan A is teaching and that if you can't do that, we'll just become a public historian. Republican. Um, it's your backup plan, you know? Um, whereas, uh, you know, um, for me, plan A was to be a public historian. Um, plan B was to teach. Yeah. <laughs> uh, public history. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, my, my role, you know, is that, um, yes, I'm teaching, but I get to teach public history, and I get to mentor my students. So to me, you know, it's become a new plan A. Uh, but um, I think that, um, uh, you know, to go back to the original question, I think the PhD program should include more of these things. Um, but there is resistance. Yeah. Um, because the old model is, is dying hard. That, um, you know, and, and, and we, we hear, um, you know, of saying some crop of PhD students come in the first year and they, they all say, I'm going to be the one that gets the job. And it's like, yes, but all of you are saying that. So, nine of you are wrong, one of you is right, which one is it? Um, so, um, you know, we, I think we have to face reality, but yeah. and in, I, some, in some cases it's a generational thing, I think. Absolutely. I have one final question for, for Brian. Um, in the liberal arts, and it's picking up from, from comments that we've heard 
so far. We, we continue to, to see uh, articles that define, redefine uh, for the public the value of a liberal arts degree and that value, that term that comes up. Often these articles are there to enhance the public comprehension of the arts, humanities, and social sciences. Um, in the Museum London Strategic Plan, I noticed the primary goal is to increase the public's perception of value for Museum London, which suggests that value and value in the arts is also a huge concern too for or a, a primary point for, for museums and galleries. Um, it is perhaps a big question, but how does how does the arts community convey that value to the public? When you are competing with the entertainment value, when you're competing with different attentions, with feet, with the metrics that are attached to funding, how do we convey that value of, of the arts uh, and heritage to the community? That, that is a, a big it question. Is a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's a question we have to face uh, every day, and it's, um, I think part of it is, is, is the value comes in the connection that people make with what we do. Um, I mean, we used to, we used to, we used to feel good about the fact that the Ontario Association of Art Gallery did a, did a survey years ago when they divided the, the population into four groups. And one of, one of the groups was, it was a very large percentage of the population, and it was the groups that didn't go to, to galleries, but had a positive idea, or a positive um, feeling towards galleries. And for the longest time, we comforted ourselves knowing that. But that, those days are, if not gone, they're, they're, their days are numbered. Uh, because we have to, that support comes from engagement now. It comes from actually participating and, and, and having an, an experience um, with the museum with an exhibition, with a program. And you know, it's interesting right now, we're going through a, through a, a process where we're, we're developing a new space in, in, the, in the museum, um, which is really focused on, we're taking away some exhibition space and increasing program space, and, and really wanting to create a space where we can engage the community in a variety of experiences uh, that are outside the necessarily the, the traditional exhibition space will we'll obviously still continue to do that. But there's a recognition that there is a competition for, for the public's um, attention and the public support. And unless we make some move to meet the, the, the public halfway in terms of what we do and find creative ways of, of presenting ourselves and our products, our exhibitions, our programs, our publications, everything that we do, in a way that that um, engages them, um, we're we're in we're in trouble. And but it's it's also that that difficult um, thing where you don't want to, for lack of a better um, term, sell out. Mm -hmm. uh, just do something because it gets feet through the door. Uh, so it's, it's a, a balancing act between continuing to do the strong research and scholarship and uh, exhibi exhibition production that we do uh, and build strong programs around those exhibitions, but find a way to convince our colleagues that it's also something that they're going to get enjoyment and fulfillment out of. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tall order. And, you know, most of these are you know, uh, short-staffed and, and have wonderful people, but you, you almost hate to keep that additional responsibility on their shoulders, but that's the kind of situation we find ourselves in today. Uh, really compelling connections, really compelling talks. I'm mindful of the fact that pizza is <laughs> But I'm also mindful that we've just spoken about uh, public engagement, and I would be remiss not to entertain a question or two from the audience before. But I'm, I'm supposing that our panelists are, are going to stick around a while to also answer some questions if you can catch them in the room. So maybe a couple of questions, and then we'll. And if, if somebody really wants to grab some pizza, definitely do so while we're asking some questions. Yeah. <laughs> comes from the community that you all talk about. Engagement with the community comes with issues that concern the community. I haven't heard social justice 
social change from once event. We spoke about engagement with the indigenous people. Yes. And it's even in the United States, Black Lives Matter. Yes. These issues, I guess you also still mentioned the 60s, how the art was involved in these issues. This is issue. So what you say is. I can tell you what the First Nations community, you're right, a lot of what they would, um, uh, if you ask them uh, you know, what issues or projects or goals do you have, a lot of them are social justice, um, uh, residential schools, water rights, um, uh, the control of their own education system, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, public historians can help in those issues. Um, certainly, um, and um, uh, I mean, the public history gets involved in, in, in a variety of ways. I mean, certainly public his historians can be um, hired to research land claims, which then they can take to court and be recompensed, um, if that's the way they choose to do so. Um, certainly, um, there are scholars who are working on exactly what happened at some specific residential schools uh, so that they can then present that information to the community. I'm thinking in particular of, um, uh, because it's the community that I work with the most, and the Six Nations of the Grand River, the Mohawk Institute, which is a residential school, um, that building is still there. Um, it's, um, which I find very ironic, um, is part of their cultural center, um, which is part of reviving their culture, um, and yet this building which was all about suppressing and, and destroying their cultures there. Um, but they, they are looking to preserve that building and um, as a residential school and using it to teach non-Indigenous people what it was like to be a child at a residential school. Um, and so um, they are um, you know, looking for uh, people who have historical skills, um, storytelling skills, interpretive skills, um, to turn this space um, to um, have more Canadians recognize what the experience was like. I mean, this is particularly coming out of the movement because of the Truth and Reconciliation um, you know, um, Commission that this has become uh, more of a prominent issue right now. They're sort of building on um, the fact that, I don't know if this is a true statement or not, but that many more Canadians now know, or A, first of all, know that residential schools exist, existed, and B, um, that um, they have had long-lasting legacies, not only the people that went to them, but also um, uh, their children and their children. It's a multi-generational effect on them. Um, and um, most of what First Nations people are interested in is social justice. When I worked at museums, um, and uh, just for one example, um, yeah, we were interested in, in co-collaborating on an exhibit. Um, and um, I came sort of in the midst of the project, um, but the beginning of the project, um, you know, when I was asking how did this start, why did you want to do this, and so on, how did it work, um, how did you, you know, pick the people from the indigenous community that wanted to participate, and so on. What I was told is that, the museum approached the community and said we'd really like to work together on this exhibit and um, we will define the goals and the themes and the artifacts all together. And the community said, yes, we're on board. However, uh, before that happens, um, we have our own demands, which was repatriation of certain objects that are in your collection um, because we want to use them for cultural and spiritual revival, uh, which did happen. Um, it was a very long process, but it did happen. Um, and also, um, that uh, the collections management policy would be overhauled and that they would help um, determine the standards of care, storage, interpretation, what could go on exhibit, what cannot go on exhibit, according to their own cultural sensitivities. Um, and that was all done um, as, um, well, not only because the staff there believed in it, but it was also uh, sort of the preliminary to building a relationship of trust between everybody before they could work together as a team. And so, you know, originally I think the project was a five-year project, it became a 15-year project, um, because all these preliminaries had to happen. And, and there's other things 
things too. I mean, we had long, long conversations about should we, you know, what what kind of spiritual information should be um, included in the exhibit? Because the debate, you know, in a nutshell was spirituality is very important to us, therefore we don't want to leave it out because how can you understand our community without it? On the other hand, it's very culturally sensitive and we don't really want to talk about it that much and we can't put any objects on display. So where, where, where are we? Where do we do this in here? Um, and for the community side, they agreed to do this because they were very specific. They said, we don't really care that much about the museum and the exhibit. What we want is a place that our children, many of whom don't live on the reserve anymore, they live in a city, who are disconnected from their elders and the traditional ways of learning their own history and culture. This is a place for our children and their children to come and learn about their own history and identity and feel comfortable in this space um, because um, the traditional systems have been, um, for many of them, have been disrupted. Um, and I was, this was in a city in which there was a lot of indigenous people who had been taken up in the 60s who didn't actually know um, what community they were from and may never know um, and um, felt uh, that they needed a place to go within the city um, uh, because they were never going to be connected to a reserve or an elder or find family members. So this was another way of approaching it. So their, their underlying goals are very different than the museum's goals. Um, from the beginning, and um, their goals are all about the social justice, education of children, um, you know, um, and educating non-Indigenous Canadians. Um, and those were the, the goals that really went out, um, because the museum um, very quickly sort of changed from, yes, this is an exhibit, which it was, but, you know, it's not just putting stuff on display, it's got all this other stuff detailed in it. Um, and uh, the people who worked on the exhibit have, have written very wonderful articles and books about how this project transformed um, museum, their museum practice, and even the community members have written a wonderful collaborative book on how it changed their um, uh, belief system uh, about museums, because they were sort of like museums, you know, you still stuff from us. Um, and so it, it uh, for me personally anyway, I mean, it transformed my um, personal belief system and, and uh, you know, I read about all these best practices, but I actually got to see it work in practice and, you know, it, it, it transformed, I think, everybody who worked in that project. It's probably the only people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was for indigenous people, it's all about social justice. Not just no, but that's that's all I can speak to. I can't I, I, I can't speak to other communities. So uh, I would I would just say that um, you know we're quite a lot of Brian at the museum. I think that um, whereas the traditional model of the museum would be that the, the experts would decide you know what the public needs to see at this time in history. Um, and after that was decided, and the, and the work goes on the walls, then you start thinking about, okay, so how are we going to do some public engagement and get some people in the door? And so I think what Brian is, you know, alluding to is the need to change that model, you know, and to be aware of well, what are the things the community is interested in, and what is it that our collection or the artists who are in our community or in our our country are telling us, and how can we actually put the public engagement piece sort of ahead of deciding what the exhibition is going to look like? But if, and I think that's the same with education. You know, like what do students need to know? You know, as opposed to what do I think that they have to know? So you know, ch shifting around those dynamics, I think, takes time for sure. I, I will say, I think. You know, there are problems in the art world, too. The art world is quite, have you noticed? The art world is quite um, sort of anti-academic, not really wanting to deal with difficult subjects. There's lots of, you know, there's lots of that resistance, too. So, you know, so that it's not just the museum that, that needs to change its game, but for sure, um, you know, what are we doing in the universities and what are artists doing? How responsible are we being to social justice? Just very quickly, I would say 80% of the students in my program 
think of their public humanities work as social justice work and public humanities as activism. And I'm pushing back against that label. Not that I don't think it should be, but that it can so easily become, they can become bad activists by trying to say it's public humanities. And the example that I give, this is a US American example, the way that history was, public history wasn't called that, public history after the Civil War reinvented the Southern you know, ideals as looking back at history to say, this is how the South really was, this is what it means. It's so easy for there to be you know, sort of a right-wing public history, anti-social justice public history, that we worry. So I'm, I'm all in favor of that as a goal, but I don't want the two to just become the same thing. It has to be thought through in a careful way that you might work with activists, whether you are an activist, support activists in a certain way. It seems like there's some interesting challenges there. I really do think there can be a, and it has been a very anti-social justice kind of public history that's been out there that you can fall into or be hard to make a case against. So I'm, I'm just, it's actually the hottest topic right now in our program, trying to start this one out. I'm going to intercede here to say that we should grab pizza. One of the reasons what we do is so that we can have a conversation afterwards and engage. Please do come up and ask questions. Stick around. And have a